What's up, everybody? It's LG Set here. You're listening to The First Mint, a podcast where I talk about NFTs and the world of Web3. The podcast comes out every Monday morning and occasionally on Wednesdays. If you like this content and you want some more, feel free to visit our Twitter page at The First Mint. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I didn't know what to expect from today's guest, Mac Flavel. He was recommended to me from a mutual friend. He was like, you should have Mac on your show. You're going to have a great time talking to him. And after doing a bit of research, I was like, oh, Mac is actually a co-founder of Dapper Labs. And previous to Dapper Labs, worked with Roham at Axiom Zen, which is the company that preceded Dapper Labs in Vancouver, Canada. Within seconds of talking to Mac, and again, I, I didn't really know much more beyond that. And we kind of made plans to do the interview, and I was like, I just want to talk to you about like you know the cycles of NFTs, what comes and goes in NFTs. Give us a bit of guidance as somebody who's who's clearly been there since the very early days of these digital collectibles. Within like a couple minutes of talking to Mac, it was clear that this was going to be a different interview because Mac is a internet culture obsessed idea machine. Somebody like that, we haven't really had anybody like that on the show. And to give you an example, to illustrate this for you before you dive in, we literally spend like 10 minutes at the start of the podcast talking about emojis. And Mac even tells me about how he used to go to emoji conferences and how he considers the fact that if you, you're you the kind of person who's able to make your own like an emoji and it becomes a popular emoji that you've pretty much made it in life. So this is a pretty wild one today. I had a great time talking to Mac and I hope you do as well. So listen to my interview with Mac Flavel, the CEO and founder of Big Head Club on the first mint. Ladies and gentlemen of the First Mint, we have a very special guest for you today, Mac Flavel, the CEO of Big Head Club. Also, come on, really like an NFT OG here, a guy who has been through many different iterations of this NFT thing, as well as what was there before NFTs. And that's why we have him on today, because we're in, we're, we're in the middle of a cycle, Mac. And many of us who are here for the first time, we came in in a bull market. We were excited. We're like, hell yeah, I love NFTs. And now, you know, we're curious if uh, if, if, if this thing's going to survive or what's going to happen. Because we read the news and, you know, people people love to dump on NFTs, as you know. And and we're kind of navigating our first bear market together. So, Mac, it's it's, it's great to have you on and hoping hoping we can we can learn a little bit from you over the next uh, over the next little bit. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dude, let's start. We always start with. The origin story. Tell us how did you get started in crypto, man? Where did that where did that where did all that begin? Because you were one of the, the founders at Axiom Zen. You were there early on, which was previously the, the, the predecessor to Dapper. But give us give us from your personal aspect like what that story is like for you. Uh, I was a co-founder of Dapper, but not of Axiom Zen for what it's worth. Though I did oh, introduce bad. Axiom Zen to their first employee. Their first employee of all time yeah. was a guy named Pierre. He's a very close friend of mine. I knew Roham from before Axiom Zen, and so when he decided he was going to open an innovation studio in Vancouver and he needed to staff up, he called me because anybody who wanted to do anything in Vancouver's tech scene 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, called me. That was like where you went. I was I was at the bottom of every funnel. Uh, and then he started Axiom Zen. I spent some time doing some consulting with them, recruiting, headhunting, that kind of thing. I eventually decided to not do that, and um, a couple years later, I sold my, what did we call it, VR Boutique Media Company to Axiom Ooh. Zen. I was working okay. as a head of marketing at a mobile attribution company, which is a dirty business, and I wasn't very inspired, and I started this newsletter about VR, because that did inspire me. That shit, I was like, okay, this is like, this is nutty. Uh, and I wrote a crazy blog post actually about how VR was going to change the world. And the next day, Facebook bought Oculus for $2 billion, whatever it was. And I was like, I'm a no. fucking prophet. Like, oh my God, I'm crazy. Uh, and so I quit my job and I called Rohan and I was like, I need you to give me a job. Like, I actually want to come work there now. And he was kind of like, no. Uh, I was like, okay, how about you acquire my like, VR boutique media company, which was my newsletter. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he's like, yeah. And I remember him saying to me, 
I remember saying, like, what if we were going to productize this? If you had to, so that one was called Hammer and Tusk. I got to tell you why it's called Hammer and Tusk, because I never used to tell people, but I'm very proud of it. Because in Alice in Wonderland, she meets Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And Tweedledee and Tweedledum tell her the story of the carpenter and the walrus. And the carpenter and the walrus harvest all of the oyster children out of the sea. And I said, we are going to harvest the minds of the youth with the VR. And the tools of the carpenter and the walrus are the hammer and the tusk. Uh, so that's where we got this name from. Sold his actions in, went there, spent a couple of years there just building weird apps, ephemeral messaging, games, strange. God, there were so many weird things that we built, like dozens and dozens of apps we shipped. Um, and none of them really worked. Like what? Like what's, what's, what's the weirdest one? Uh, I, already, I already love your storytelling, your storytelling uh, flavor, your flavor of storytelling. Please tell me more. We built an app that would only work. Uh, Apple wouldn't publish this one. I was so sad. I swear oh. to God, this was my best idea. But uh, well, it wasn't. no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was just a good idea. Uh, yes. We built an app that was a browser that only worked for emoji domain. So five years ago, you could register emoji domain, which were very dangerous for like phishing and all that dumb shit. But in West Samoa... The TLD.WS, they didn't give a fuck in West Samoa. You could rent, uh, register whatever you wanted. It was the only country on earth that would let you register emoji-based domains. And so there is a series, there's like probably dozens but not hundreds of emoji domain in the world to this day. And I made an app that only worked for looking at emoji domain. It was really fucking weird. I used to be really into emoji. I went to like emoji conferences. I made an emoji language learning app. I got really, really into emoji. Before there were... NFTs, there you you can start to notice a pattern. After emoji, I really okay, got okay, into stickers. Wait, 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 hold on. Tell me what what happens at the emoji conference? I need to I need to know what that is. <laughs> the emoji the, <laughs> the emoji conference was eye opening because not only was it filled with a lot of eggplants, and there was there was like a lot of eggplant vibrators and like weird, interesting people and things, but also the Unicode consortium was there. And the Unicode Consortium are the people who decide what emoji are allowed to be used as emoji. And that year, it was 2016, that year they explained to the group that, I forget how many new emoji they were launching every year at that point, but there wasn't very many applying. And so 50% of people who submitted an emoji application to the Unicode Consortium got their emoji approved. And I always swore that if you wanted to have a legacy in this world, the single most likely chance you had of leaving an impact on this world was creating an emoji. Because you had a one in two percent chance, like a 50% chance of it working. And then, like quite honestly, it would be probably used billions of times over the next couple of years. Emoji is how most people are going to have legacy. We did NFTs, and so we kind of figured out legacy on our own. But emoji was my like backup plan. Uh, in fact, emoji story for you. Fun oh, fact, the woman behind the dumpling emoji. God, I hope I'm right about this. Now I might be making an ass of myself. I'm 80% sure the woman behind the dumpling emoji is the same woman who did the fail. Oh, no, I'm 100% sure. Who did the fail whale for Twitter. The fail whale Twitter artist did the peacock emoji and the dumpling emoji. And I learned all this together and I pitched Biddle... Billetong. So they did this thing at the emoji conference where they're like... You need to, well, you don't need to, but you should, if you want to, stand here and uh, pitch, like, what you think the next emoji should be. This doesn't count as the real application. Like, you have to go through the process, but let's, you know, test it out and hear your best ideas. And I was sitting there thinking about the fact that there was, like, 17 different sushi emoji, which is cool because... Um, emoji come out of Japan originally, but also like deeply insignificant to a fuck ton of people who don't eat sushi, who don't live in a part of the world where 17 flavors of sushi make sense. I live near Vancouver, so we have 17 flavors of sushi, but not everybody does. And so I was thinking about it and I was like, what does accessibility, like the, the young girl who did the hijab emoji was there and she was thinking along the same lines, right? She was like, listen, there's fucking, maybe not millions, hundreds of thousands of us wear hijab, and there's no representation of that in emoji. So she designed that, and she was a 15-year-old kid, and it was a big deal. But I was standing there in line, 
being like, I love pitching shit and just making things up and going for it. So I was in line to pitch my emoji, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I looked up uh, Biltong, which I've never had, and I'm probably pronouncing like a dumb whitey, but it is essentially beef jerky, and it is the most, as I understand it, ignoramus over here, but it is the most commonly eaten food in Africa. And I was like, you have, you know, over a billion people on that continent. I don't think most of them are eating sushi every day. And they are all coming online. And, like, I spend a bunch of time really interested in gifts and how gifts could be used to facilitate communication. And one of the interesting lessons that came of that was that, like, um, I met somebody who was using gifts to explain how to put on condoms. And, like, everybody laughs and was like, oh, my goodness. But it's actually fucking brilliant, right? Like, you were trying to yeah. stop the spread of STDs. This is this visual right. communication medium. And I was like, oh, that's so smart. Like, you're a fucking genius, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, except that data is expensive. Data is very mm-hmm. expensive. And so mm-hmm. sending gifts is not actually an effective way to communicate. But emoji are. Emoji are both visual but also low on data costs. So this is a very powerful method of communication. And then it's emerging uh, economies of Africa with so many people who are coming online and they skip desktop and they skip uh, laptops and they're just on their mobile device first. I thought that emoji was fucking brilliant. That's the kind of thing that happens at emoji conferences. All right. So, Mac, what I'm hearing from you right now is that basically, like, you have forever been a, like, connoisseur of, like, digital communications or like like basic means of digital communications like how how would you classify like the emoji gif uh, and i guess now like into nfts like what what do you, do you have like a name for that genre of chat i guess no i i think that like a picture is worth a thousand words a video is worth a thousand pictures communication is i remember being in like grade nine english and then being like yeah. communication is hard and communication is important me being like no it's yeah. fucking not open your mouth flap your fucking lips and push air through them you're gonna you're gonna communicate but actually that's like deeply not true communication is hard and interesting and important and pictures matter a lot um a lot, a lot, and I find that interesting, and I don't think that's going away in our lifetime. I think that's the opposite of going away. Hmm. Okay. Okay, that's fair. So no name, but something that you knew, you kind of felt for a long time would, was was you, you kind of had a theory on for a long time. What do you? What? Do, what? Do, so what do you? So so can you reconnect the dots for me? So we're talking we're talking emojis, and then you're working with Roham. At right, Acme, right, right. Yeah. And then, so... and then, and then Dapper time. How did that come about? Yeah, so it was 2017. The summer before I'd been at the Emoji Conference. Um, and that was that was the first time blockchain took over everything. Like, we didn't have the word Web3 yet. That didn't exist. But suddenly blockchain, because everybody's making money on Bitcoin, and the shit coins was going everywhere it wasn't DeFi. it was just people selling shit coins with like unspecific promise of future use cases and uh the cto it it wasn't the cto but basically the cto at axiom zen was named dieter and he's co-founder of dapper as well he really loved and believed and cared in about um bitcoin he'd been mining bitcoin on his laptop when you could do that like he was there in the old days and when i started there with that hammer and tusk uh newsletter thing Roham had said to me like if you could verticalize this and do this for other things write your summaries and build out the audience like you are around this newsletter are there other things that you would do and I said yeah I would do AI next I think AI is a really really big fucking idea Mm -hmm. Um, that that is not just a big idea but is imminently significant like in our in the short period of time and I remember him saying to me what about blockchain I was like fuck blockchain blockchain's for assholes (laughs) Uh, and that was in like 2015 when I started working there. And then 2017, um, blockchain was so hot. It was so crazy. Like it wasn't as hot as it is say last summer. It wasn't NFT land. Board apes didn't exist. There was nothing to identify with. Remember we just said pictures matter and all that. Like it is very, very fucking hard to understand as a normal muggle, why you would care about Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. There's very little to hang your understanding or your enthusiasm or value around. Um, But you put those little pictures, you put those faces, you know, babies recognize faces before they see anything like just they, they do. 
There's something in our brain that's wired to see eyes, nose, and mouth. Fascinating thing else. I was looking at, what are those called? Roar, Rorschach tests? I can't pronounce that word. But whatever the ink blot tests are, where it's like, oh, what do you see? And are you crazy? Oh, you mean like the, like the psychological thing? Yeah. Like that they, they for like, uh, like people at mental institutes and stuff like that? Is that what you mean? Like from the movies yes. when we were kids? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I was looking at a bunch of those last night that I think somebody's been releasing as NFTs or something. Oh, and yeah. every single one of them looks like a face to me. It just does. I, and I suspect I'm not alone in that. So anyhow, faces really matter. Um, definitely in the first wave, for me, what was the first wave? I'm sure the like old, old timers will give you like, oh no, the older first wave. But for me, yeah. the first wave was 2017. It was crazy. Everybody was writing about Bitcoin. If they could, like everybody was trying to find reasons. You could be reading a dog food magazine and they'd find a way to talk about Bitcoin. It was just critical to everybody. And so at that time we decided to build crypto kitties. And I remember him coming to me and saying like, Hey, I need you to make the blockchain fun. And me being like, Hey, how about you fuck off? Because that's a stupid idea that nobody wants anything to do with. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, it's cute that you have an opinion, but shut the fuck up and do your job. And I was like, Oh yeah, right. I have one of those and it's working yeah. for you. So I should yeah. probably do that. And so I did. And I, I left and I saw CryptoPunks. And so I bought one for $35 because it looked like Wonder Woman. And I um, have always wanted to build a gardening game where you don't know what kind of seeds will come out of the ground, what color your flowers will be, and what kind of bird song you will make, depending on what kind of flowers in your garden. And I had this hypothesis at the time because we kept building all these consumer apps that were failing that you should always include cats if you're building things for consumers. Right. It's Naturally. stupid not to. Of course. Yeah. And so cats plus crypto punks plus gardening game. I came back to the office and I was like, gang, let's make cats fuck on the blockchain. What? And everybody's mm -hmm. like, you're totally fucking ludicrous, but sure. And uh, we did. And well, and then Dita was like, because I actually have a text message I sent to Richard. You know, Richard, the big NFT collector. I've known him for like 10 years. Okay. And uh, I, he was my Bitcoin guy before anybody else. Like he Your was Bitcoin the guy. Bitcoin guy. What is that? What do you mean Bitcoin? Like you make it, you honestly make it sound like you would show up at your house late at night with a backpack full of Bitcoin and be like, do you want, do you want blueberry Kush Bitcoin or like white spider? <laughs> like he, we would go eat Taiwanese food, not in the middle of the night, but late at night at Cambian 23rd at a place to burn down now. And, uh, he would, he would talk around Bitcoin and not tell me all of his stories, but he, he knew about Bitcoin before anybody else that I knew knew right. about Bitcoin. Okay. And when I said, when Rohamad said, you know, you've got to make the blockchain fun, I was like, okay, we're going to do cat fucking to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. And I sent a text to Richard. I still have a picture of it. It's like, I think they're going to build my cat fucking idea. And he was like, oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> 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 Which is funny because, you know, he really likes NFTs these days. Uh, but, but yeah, no, they, they, Dieter was like, first of all, you can't mine Bitcoin by having cats fuck. That doesn't make any sense. And second of all, um, you need non fungible cats. You need cats that are not the same because if this one's going to have genes and this one's going to have genes and they're going to make a new cat with new genes, you need fungibility. And I was like, sure. I, Sounds like you're talking about mushrooms. I have no idea what that word means, but like you do your part, I'll do my part and let's do greatness together. And so he wrote the 721 standard, which of yeah. course led to sort of, well, a lot of things. Do you, do you think, do you think blockchain is fun now? Yes. I think blockchain is not only fun. I think it's important. Which tell me about each one. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit more about each, each of those. Why is, it, why is it fun? And then after, I want to know why you think it's important. I think the reason it's fun is because of that thing uh, where if I have a coffee mug and you're like, I want to buy that coffee mug from you. Let me start. Okay. If there's a coffee mug at a store and you're like, oh, you can buy that coffee mug for $5. I'm like, okay, it's worth $5 to me. Then if I own that coffee mug and you're like, hey, can I buy that coffee mug from you? I will give you $10. I'm like, no fucking way. This is my coffee mug. Once you own something, 
many slash most people become emotionally attached to it in a way that makes everything else about it more fun. Ownership is literally a basis of play. Uh, basically, you can pink slip everything, and that's fun. That's really like, as it, uh, I may or may not like to gamble, and uh, you can't gamble if you're renting everything. Like when we when we made Crypto Kitties, I was playing a lot of Hearthstone, and I stopped buying cards in Hearthstone because it just felt dumb. And I, it was I wasn't like getting up on a pedestal and being like, oh man, like if I don't own my digital assets in this Blizzard game, then I fucking quit. Fuck this. It was nothing like that. I was just like, I feel like. I feel like I'm just lighting money on fire when I'm renting these cards for money and I don't want to. I want to buy those cards and then I want to bet you that I'm smarter than you and take your fucking cards or lose mine when I win. Right. Uh, there's a lot of fun that comes from actually caring about the outcome. And one way to care about the outcome is to own the thing. So there's like a word for the bias that you have for ownership and for emotional value attached to things that you own when that same thing not owned by you has significantly less emotional value to you. Uh, that's why it's fun. And the reason it matters is because... Wait, hold on. I got to stop you there. So, so the, does that, is your theory about fun and ownership, is that, are we talking specifically NFTs now? Because when you started, you were like, Bitcoin blockchain is all fucking stupid. And do you, like, do you think people have that same sentiment that you're describing, which I agree with. It's a great way to put it. Like, do people have the same thing when they're like, I now own some fucking chain link? You know what I mean? Like, is that is that is that the same feeling there? Like people are attached? I think it is much harder to understand what you own. So NFTs are like rocks. You reach down, you pick up a bunch and you're like, oh, here's a handful of rocks. And these right. fungible currencies are like liquid. You reach in and you dip out with your spoon and you're like, okay, you can tell me that I have this much liquid. But there's no difference between this liquid and the liquid still in the bucket and the liquid on the left side of my spoon and the liquid on the right side of my spoon. It's just very difficult to create that strong sense of emotional attachment. Like we are right. used to um, delineation of objects and delineation of ideas and concepts and people. And so to blur it all together and say you own some of this math, which is all an NFT is anyways, except it's math with a fucking picture. Back to mm -hmm. where we started, the pictures matter. And pictures of faces matter even more. It's just like... In the, in the lizard brain that we all have fucking trying to figure out how to, how to do everything except breathe, which is, you know, the under lizard brain. And then on top of the breathing and the eating thing, the lizard brain is like, oh, show me the lizard. Show me faces. This is how I'm going to find value. <laughs> uh, so I think that's, I mean, there's other reasons they're fun, but that's a lot of it. Also, gotcha's fucking rule, right? The Japanese taught us 10 years ago that if you want to make hundreds of millions of dollars in mobile games, make sure you've got gotchas. And so now all NFTs are dropped as gotchas. Almost all NFTs are dropped as gotchas. That will at some point get regulated away and NFTs will still be fun and still matter, not just because of the lottery draw of the gotcha. Uh, and I think they matter because I think ownership matters. And I think that that was not obvious to me before things like Donald Trump became president of the United States of America. I think like... Uh, we live in an interesting time in the Western world. So you and I both live in Canada and we have not known hardship in our time. We've not known hardship in our time. The generation before us arguably had the Vietnam war, but even the Canadians didn't have that. Like maybe the Americans before that was obviously the Korean war and world war two. And I am not speaking for other people in the world and what they've gone through. But for yeah. most people that I have ever met, they've not been through shit. They're soft as fuck. We are all soft as fuck. We're pretty like, soft. I, I, I do agree. I do agree with you there. Yeah. We're pretty and, like, and myself you know, included like, in oh, this. Yeah. When COVID hit and it was like, the first thing that you could just tell people were like, I need toilet paper. To me, it was like, oh man, like we don't know. We don't know what it takes to survive at all. Like we, we reach for the most basic luxuries and people were crying about like, I can't go on a cruise. This is like, Oh fuck! Like if things get if things ever actually get bad, like we're we're pretty fucked. Like we're not we're not gonna make it. <laughs> and yeah. that wasn't obvious for me until sort of semi recently. It was it was like I took for granted mostly reasonable, mostly democratic, mostly capitalistic. The free market with a little bit of help from thoughtful individuals is going to take care of most people. We are trending towards a better life for all people. I take all of this for granted. And 
uh, the, the social contract, right? People talk about the social contract and, and what we've all flirted with seeing is how fucking thin the thread that binds the social contract is. Give a motherfucker a bad day for three days. And whether you want to reference like Lord of the Flies as fiction or the Stanford experiments as kind of bullshit science, but either way, it doesn't take long to find the edge of the social contract that we right. hold between us and bind us. And in a world where you're like, okay, the social contract that I used to place an awful lot of faith in is more fragile than I wanted to admit, in that world, digitally provable ownership matters. It's my shit and you can't fucking touch it matters. Or it's my shit and I want to give it away and that's my prerogative, not yours. All of that matters. This is, this is, this is, you know, this is the part, this, this is, this is what I, is I like about you, Mac, already is that it's like, it's authentic because you've taken me through like your, your, your origin of thinking there. Like it's like a purposeful thought that comes down to, to why NFTs are important. So is that, so this is what you tell us. So this is blockchain is important. And that's, that's the reason why is that like ownership really does matter. And if, d depending what happens in the next couple decades, that that's something that's going to really matter is owning the digital assets. That's, that's to kind of summarize. What you're saying. Yeah, and, and ownership absolutely doesn't matter in a bunch of other shit. Like, what I find most interesting is that culturally we're mm -hmm. moving away from ownership. Your and my parents were like, you know how I'm cool? Because I own a cool car. Mm -hmm. My kids would rather fucking punch themselves on the face on YouTube than own a car. They couldn't imagine why the fuck they would own a car. That's some dumbass shit. Like, to pay for a car and maintain a car and pay for gas for a car. Who fucking cares? What I care about is getting where I need to go. And I can do that using this magical little thing in my pocket called Uber or Lyft or whatever. Same right. with, you know, like so many other things. We have got into the sharing economy. That was a fucked up term. Nobody was sharing anything. But like before we all got obsessed with NFTs, that idea of yeah. co-use becomes really, really big deal. And I think that's true, to be clear. I don't think that a lot of people care about home ownership as a status symbol anymore. I think they care about home ownership as a sense of safety, but not as a status symbol. Ownership as a status symbol is drifting away in a lot of things. But what's interesting is what it doesn't drift away in, which is now overpriced JPEGs. What up, Carly? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I saw your chat with Carly a couple months back. Um, okay, so on that then, so what, so, so, you're clearly more into blockchain than you were when Rohan first told you, like, let's go work on this blockchain shit. Yep. You've got a great theory behind it. So what, so like, t take me through the thinking there that it's like, okay, people, people want to own a house because they want to feel safe. Digital asset ownership is going to matter a lot. How does that, how do, can you, can you skip ahead to like, if people don't want, if the masses of people don't want overpriced JPEGs, which I think we all kind of know is very unlikely that we're going to, you know, billions of people are going to be like, finally, I own some cats, some digital cats and shit. Although there could be some version of that. What, what then with that theory, which is really strong of just like the ownership part is the part that's most important. How does, how does the ownership bull case that you're presenting for blockchain, how does that translate to mass adoption? And is that what it translates to? Because it's a very, that's a very subjective question. So that might not even be it. But how does that, let's say, how does that flower? What is, what is that, what does that seed into? You're talking about the game where you have, you don't know what's going to flower, like you don't know what the seeds are. Tell me like this ownership thing that you think is the strongest element and why it's important to blockchain, also why it's fun. What, what, what comes out of the pot? I think we, so a couple of things. One, nobody ever talks about the blockchain again, just like nobody talks about location-based apps. My first startup, startup was a location-based gaming company. And we tried to make games around the fact that knowing where you are was significant. And we knew that by 2022, nobody was going to say, ah, let me use my location-based app Uber in order to call an Uber taxi to me, right? Like once something becomes ubiquitous, it goes away. So definitely nobody talks about Web3 or ownership or blockchain. A bunch of these things become assumed. Uh, second of all, probably we see some very significant large-scale adoption in places that don't have some of the assumptions that we have around that social contract that I talked about. What was so crazy about the last X number of years was between COVID and Trump, I was like, oh, these, these are all lies. Like all of these niceties and pleasantries we've been telling each other are thinly veiled threats. I got a fucking knife under the table, don't cross me, seems to be the attitude of many people. And now COVID is, seems to be on its way out. The you know, shitlord of Trumpdom seems to be on its way out. 
And so we're all getting back to pretending that everything's good and fine. But there's a bunch of places in the world where that is not the case. There's a bunch of places in the world where you don't trust your government and where a grandma... I remember I used to know this old Romanian and he was like, my mother, she knows how to blow up a tank. And I was like, that's fucked up. And he's like, well, that's the life we've led, isn't it? And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, if you lie down here and it goes over here, there's this place in the transmission where you can stick a fucking Molotov cocktail in there and take out the whole tank. And I was like, okay, that's really crazy. Um, People who have got that kind of existence, who can then understand digital ownership, that's a big deal. So when it goes large scale, again, nobody will be talking about it, but it doesn't necessarily start in New York or in LA or in London. It starts in Belarus or in, you know, Mogadishu or something. Uh, But then the other thing that I was going to tell you about ownership of these things... um, Oh, yeah. Uh, There's a lot of things. Like, so when I used to hitchhike around, it used to drive me nuts that I knew there was a bunch of people who were going east, and I was trying to go east. And if they knew me, they would take me east. But those three things didn't happen at once. And so instead, I was standing outside in the fucking rain while the sun was setting, not getting where I was trying to go. And that was annoying to me. And I used to sit there hitchhiking and be like, God damn it, how, how, like, how do you solve this problem? And the answer was Uber. Uber is a better way for people who are going somewhere and people who want to be going somewhere to coordinate their efforts. And it works out really well for everybody. That's a very, very, very old problem. Um, and sometimes technology solves very, very old problems. Like, where do I stay tonight? Uh, sometimes, sometimes it changes everything. God, you're going to ask me for an example and I'm not going to think of one. But what uh, the hypothetical example I'm getting to is... Um, the blurring of financial capital and social capital. So as a kid, I'm like, oh man, I love Pop Smoke. Pop Smoke is fucking amazing. RIP Pop Smoke, all of this. And then I finish college and I like leave my dorm room and I'm like, oh man, I like, I'm gonna go get a girlfriend and she doesn't want to, you know, sleep under a Pop Smoke poster, let alone nine of them that I have on my wall. So I'm gonna go take that part of my identity, fold it up, slip it under the bed, throw it in the garbage, whatever it is, get rid of it and move on. And that's, that's what fandom has been like. That's, that's the journey. Mm-hmm. But with NFTs, we're at a point where like, no, don't take those posters off your wall and put them in the garbage, take those posters off your wall and sell them to the next Pop Smoke fan who can't believe that you were lucky enough to be at that concert that he did in Brooklyn in the park way back when. That's a really interesting idea that that social capital, that cultural capital that you earn through what you do and who you are, through attestations, through proof of knowledge, through proof of fandom, through proof of attendance, through all of those different methods that we can use to generate and capture and social signal with NFTs, right? NFTs are, what's the line? NFTs are the stars in the constellation of our identity. When you say to yourself, this is who I am, I imagine a world where you just point to your NFT portfolio and it says this is who I am. And it doesn't work to look at all 200 NFTs that you own. What works is to look at your MySpace top eight. Remember MySpace? Remember the top four friends that when the CSN oh, I know, I, got Oh, in? I know all about that, man. Oh, yeah. You, you can still do that shit on Facebook. You can still be like, here's my best friend and my top six photos or whatever. So that shit, when it's like about your NFTs that you have earned and have cultural capital, but can then be converted into financial capital. I did a call with like a bunch of Fortune 500 CIOs last week, and I was trying to explain to them that their loyalty program should be resellable. That their loyalty programs are cool, but the greatest form of value you can build for a loyalty program is to attach it to a token and let me as a fan say, I'm good. Mm. I'm old enough that I don't want to fly no more, Alaska Mm. Airlines. Let me take my loyalty, bundle it up, and sell it to somebody else. Because I fucking earned that, and it's mine. And these guys could not get it. They were like, no, that's your loyalty. You cannot sell that. But the ability to take social value and turn it into financial value is a big, weird idea of blockchain. So answering your question, what does this look like in X number of years when this all blurs? I suspect that we stop drawing such hard lines. And then a weird example to think about how other people look at that is free-to-play video games came about because um, 
in China, you would make a game, and three weeks before you would launch your game, you would find it on every black market store shelf, like in right. all the fucking night markets. Yeah. Because they just ripped off your shit and released it. And eventually, some Chinese game maker was like, how about, fuck you, have the game, it's free, but if you want the Sword of Destiny, you gotta pay us $100, or, or $1, or whatever it is, and it's locked into our server. That model of free-to-play gaming, which is now, you know, a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry, emerged because of piracy in China. And what's interesting about free-to-play video gaming in China versus the West now is that you're not really allowed to pay to win Western games. I went paintballing one time, and there was this guy who had an automatic weapon on a tripod that he sat out the ground, and he just sprayed. I swear to God, he was shooting like over 100 bullets a minute. It was insane. And the rest of us were like, okay, well... We're not playing, like, we're not winning, we can't shoot him, this is fucking dumb. Yeah. In video games, in the West, if you do that shit, the same thing happens. So you buy yeah. cosmetics, you buy disposables, you buy things that let you flex how cool you are, but not let you buy better performance in game. Whereas traditionally, Chinese games are like, oh, sorry, do you have a thousand dollars but not a thousand hours? Cool. Buy the big ass sword of fuck you. You were absolutely able to do that. And I think we will see that approach to um so in that case it's it's games and play and earning your right to play versus buying your right to play i think we'll see that applied to much larger things outside of games as blockchain becomes ubiquitous and we can start to blur the lines between social and financial capital which has just not been possible before how would you do that what measure or method do you have to do that blockchain gives us that method Mac, what what parts of what we're doing right now, this current, like the end of this cycle of all this, you know, kind of COVID speculation the, and specifically with NFTs, they came about, um, became you know, far more mainstream than they were with when, when you when you made the, the sex cats. Um, what what part of what we're doing now and maybe some of the common assumptions we have now, which parts which parts won't survive? Like what 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 kind of stuff are we like into now? And people are like, I'm so bullish on this or like this project like mooned and it's huge like what Road what is, what of that stuff is like that's not that's not going to be around in a couple of years so like don't <laughs> either don't hold it or roadmaps don't. are dumb roadmaps roadmaps are fucking dumb okay uh if the value of the thing that you're bought is tied to a roadmap and that roadmap does not exist in perpetuity then the value of the thing that you bought has an expiry date hmm. so so like like if you have a roadmap and it has a hundred items on it, mm. then I buy the NFT after 50% of those roadmap items are done. Then in yeah. theory, I'm only getting 50% of the value because only 50% of the roadmap is left. But when we are at 98% uh, completed roadmap, then who's going to buy the NFT? Now, if you don't associate the value with the roadmap, is the value for the, you, that you subscribe to that NFT is measured in a different method, that could be different. But most people are like, oh, what's the utility? What's the roadmap? Most projects pitch that shit. That's all, that's all a uh, fucking false god, deeply and truly. Right. That's just going away. Wow, convicting thought. What, what, so, so if you're somebody like me or anybody, most of the people listen who are just like, we're, we're, we're kind of, well, I would say we're blockchain casuals. We're pretty. I'd say I feel like we're, we feel like we're pretty into it. But again, this is kind of our first. This is, we're, we've kind of like completed our first loop now. We're just like we got into it. Things have crashed, and now we kind of get it. We're like, okay, you know, this is these are the factors that can affect it. Obviously, we'll always be surprised. But it's like we're like I. I personally feel I'm like okay, I kind of understand this shit now. You know what I mean? I remember hearing about Crypto Kitties five six years ago, but I was like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. But now I'm like, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in here. People, when I go to a party or I meet some people, they're like, "This is this is LG, the NFT guy," you know, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, I'm the NFT guy. I don't know about that, but like, I'm I'm in." What what like if I'm just going to be a collector, you know, this is a podcaster collector. What what kind of stuff should I lay, like be looking forward to right now, right? Because like you're describing a lot of great ideas, like the mass adoption, the ownership, but like. As like an individual dude, like what 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 am I supposed to be looking forward to? Like, do I just wait three years for there to be you know it was Crypto Kitties and then it was like Top Shot and Apes and then like in three years there's gonna be some other thing that comes about and I'm just like great gonna gonna get in on that from the ground floor. Like, is that what I'm trying to do? Uh, one of the fun ideas around 
crypto blockchain web three is the dissolution of the dissolving of the line between creator and consumer. Mm -hmm. And so if I was going to be spending the next little while in what was a bear market, trying to figure out how to spend my time in this industry that I loved, I would think about playing and creating, um, not because you need to make a hundred million dollar project, but because to really, un like after CryptoKitties, we would call any brand on earth we wanted to. And they'd be like, oh, well, we talked to another agency that said they know about NFTs. And I'm like, yeah, that's because they read my blog post. Right. I did it. I wrote about it. And I is we. We did it. We wrote about it. And then they read it. And now they're telling you what we learned firsthand. Uh, so I would encourage people who, who are like, oh, I really love this space. Like, this is a big idea. This is fun. This is interesting. This is weird. But also, as you say, I don't know what to do now. Um, Try, try building. And that doesn't mean, like I said, you have to go try and disrupt apes as like the next big thing. Just build something fun and interesting. Go play with Manifold. Go play with uh, OpenSea. Go play with all the other weird things. Go release a fucking NFT on foundation of your kid drawing the cat's asshole. And no, nobody's going to buy it, but, but you're going to learn through the process of playing all sorts of things. Uh... I would do that, and I don't know. I, to this day, wish that there was less financial interest in NFTs uh, and more cultural interest in NFTs. Like, if you told, look at every single NFT that was bought over the last two years, however many that's been. It's been a lot. Yeah. If you told every single person who bought every single one of those that they would not, not be able to sell it for a profit, that was absolutely off the table. I spent quite a while trying to figure out how we could contractually make NFTs that couldn't go up in value. And there's no way people are just going to like work around it with wallets and shit. But I was really trying to make NFTs that could not go up in value. And the point is that 90% of at least, at least 90% of those NFTs sold in the last year, if the buyer had known that they could not go up in value, I'm not saying they go down, they just could not go up, they wouldn't have bought them. Most people are buying NFTs are buying them for the price to go up. And... If that's what you're here for, you probably should go fuck off for three years because, or, or two years or, or until, you know, the sun rises again and wheat grows in the fields because yeah, like trying to, trying to flip things in the dark, in the, in the cold dark of winter, it's probably possible, probably got to be smarter than you or me or anybody listening to this. Like that takes real grindy skill, which is why I say build and play and have fun when that is the most useful use of time. And like, to be clear, Dapper is filled with incredibly smart people who worked very, very hard and all sorts of things, but also they were just positioned for the tide to rise. And when the tide did rise because of a pandemic and because of blockchain technology becoming more accessible and everything else, they were in the best place on earth to capture that momentum. And so if you're really, really here for the long haul on this, Build and play so that when the tide comes back in, you're like, oh, shit, I'm out here on a boat. Who knew? Whereas a bunch of other people can be like, oh, fuck, we went into the mountains because uh, we couldn't make easy money. And now they got to get back to the shore and they get out into the water and then build their raft. And while they're doing that, you're just fucking having a gale time. Hmm. What, what do you think people in like 24 months from now, what do you think that they're going to wish they had known? Hindsight's 2020. What's the hindsight in 24 months from now for people? I mean, broadly, I think the... So that's a hard question because, like, it's if winter's here or whatever, I don't... It, it, I think people should just buy less shitty NFTs. Like, people should buy more NFTs that they love and buy less NFTs that they aren't proud of. Um, I think that would broadly be a lesson for everybody. But I don't think many people are going to be buying shitty NFTs in the next two years. So that lesson probably doesn't apply all that well. Um, I really think people are going to wish that they knew more on a first-hand basis. And that, just going back to that same thing of ship something. Like, to be clear, I'm not an engineer. I've never built anything myself in my fucking life. But um, there's just so much you can learn by doing that you cannot learn by reading, you cannot learn by talking, you cannot learn by listening, you can only learn by doing. And two years from now, 
People are just going to wish that they'd done a little bit more. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be huge. And the big thing is give it away for free. I love this shit. What that goblins fucking set up, giving that stuff away for free. It's so fucking good because you have, like, I feel like I have a responsibility to people who bought NFTs that I made. I don't know where that responsibility ends. It doesn't go on forever. It's not more important than my responsibility to my family or these kind of things. But I feel a genuine responsibility to those people. On the other hand, if I had given those fucking things away for free, I wouldn't have responsibility to shit. That'd be amazing. And so build free things. Release them. Tell people about them. Play with them. That is what people will regret not doing two years from now when being an effective builder in this space is once again a very lucrative opportunity. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you were a fan of the goblins. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you go on spaces and make weird noises? Did you hear about that? No. no. Oh yeah. That was amazing. That was fucking incredible. I bought a goblin at one I bought a goblin at two point five and then sold it at one point five before they went up to eight. <laughs> I fucked up. Uh, okay. And I, I love the goblins. I love what they were doing there. Uh, this space takes itself so fucking seriously. It's incredible. You all got to get your heads out of your asses. And the goblins took their heads out of their asses and grunted on Twitter for a while. And it was fun. Mac, you're the kind of person who clearly has an idea every two seconds. And I can relate. I find... Uh, especially in this space, especially in a new medium like this, for me, it's been really overwhelming. Tell me, uh, in, and I can ask you like eight questions in one here. So, uh, but I feel like you're going to deliver us a, another fantastic rant. Tell me what, what you're up to at Big Head and how, how you fit all those ideas into that Big Head. <laughs> Look at this colossal dome. <laughs> uh... We are building things, and right now the big idea that's interesting to us is what happens if different communities play together. So we are building Boat Game, and Boat Game is going to let different groups of people uh, defined as people who own the same NFT come together and play together. And I think that's kind of fun and weird, and we're doing some other explorations of games mostly around that concept. Um, what happens in that case? The other thing I've been thinking about lately is when you look at the emergence of NFTs and you look at the emergence of mobile apps, there are many parallels from a technology perspective about what early days of the App Store were like on the iPhone and what early days of NFTs were like. And so it's interesting from a technology perspective to draw those conclusions. But what I've been thinking about lately, because I'm not a technology guy particularly, I just kind of do this because I have to. But I really like our stories. I always tell people I was the kitty, not the crypto part of crypto kitties. And so when you look at IP, when you look at world building and storytelling, what does this stage of NFTs look like? What can we draw comparisons to? And I'm pretty sure, but not completely sure, the answer is pulp comics from like 1930s America. And so I'm trying to go learn the lessons that those people taught us. Like there were hundreds or thousands of different comics that were created that were run in daily scripts that were run on the back page of magazines and most of them we've never heard of don't care about don't know about on the other hand superman probably did a billion dollars last year batman probably did two billion dollars last year like when you find the winners that's a big fucking deal and i feel like the analogies to like we said technology is the apps but maybe the ip is those pulp comics and so Thinking through that and what the implications of that are is fun and interesting, but mostly just figuring out how communities can play together. When I don't make NFTs, I make games. That's like the other thing that I do. Mm -hmm. My little pulp comics, so it's like people in space and shit, right? That's what you're talking about? Like Green Llama? Like Dick Tracy, like The Shadow, yeah. like the early black and white days, terrible yeah, yeah. art. They had to get them out real fast. Those yeah. were a very interesting narrative format. Mm. Same time that things like Tarzan was doing, like we think audiobooks and podcasts are interesting. Radio plays, War of the Worlds, man, that shit brought America to its knees. It was crazy. Yeah. People were yeah. freaking out. That oh, yeah. era of storytelling is really interesting. And I think, I love the expression that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I think history Ooh. might be rhyming right now. Shit, okay. All right, now we're at a part of the show because I know you got to go. Uh, we do this with every guest, Mac, and it's called, it's called, uh, would you rather? Okay. And I give you, I give you two options and you tell me which one you would rather. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Simple, mm. simple game. Mm. 
Okay, Batman or Superman? Batman. Fuck. Uh, Marvel or DC? Marvel. Sorry, we're talking comics. Would you rather you and your entire family are lizards or you and your entire family are cats? Cats. Why? Lizards are cold-blooded, so they have to stay hot, and that becomes an all-consuming thing. Wouldn't want to have to deal with that. <laughs> wow, man. I don't, I don't, I don't even process that at, that at that speed. Would you rather you are the inventor of the GIF or the inventor of the emoji? Emoji. Would you rather they design a line of emojis about you or you never see another NFT roadmap ever again? You never see another NFT roadmap again. Boom. That's it. There you go, man. That's the fastest. That was the fastest would you rather I've ever seen. So you passed. You passed. You passed our, our game show. Cool. You like my <laughs> black circle shirt? <laughs> what is it? It's a thing I'm trying. I'm going to start wearing black circles on all my shirts. So oh, I made this. <laughs> Amazing. Like a personal, like a personal branding, or is it some kind of like shamanist, like shaman type thing, like a like a spiritual thing? I haven't figured out why yet. I just know that there's black circles. You just <laughs> can other people do it? Or is it just for you? No, no, I, I'm big into decentralized IP, and this is just an idea, <laughs> and I really think we should decentralize the fuck out of it. And the whole world should wear black circles. Oh, okay. So when are you going to drop the the NFT line where it's like you you buy the NFT and then you get a, a t shirt with a black you get a you get a monthly shirt with a black t shirt or a monthly I shirt. I really with a black really shirt. dislike digital integrations with NFTs. I do not believe that you can elegantly do digital and physical integrations of NFTs with the limitations of the technology today. So I will not be dropping that subscription box. So we're not going to get a white 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 shirt black circle subscription from from Big Head anytime no. soon. Yeah. Not tied to an NFT. I might just start that fucking subcom business on the side or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you could just do a, what was it, Frank and Oak, where they just sent you clothes every month? You could just do the Frank and Oak, but it's just, it's only one shirt. It's the same shirt you get every month. I'm testing it's different the... sizes of black circles, though, so, you know, there's diversity <laughs> yeah. and interesting things. How big's the circle going to be this month? <laughs> That's a great idea. Who knows? It could be huge. It could be titty to titty. We don't know. <laughs> Uh, Mac Favell, pleasure to have you on, man. Thanks so much for joining us. We're, we're gonna have to have you back because there's, I feel like there's so much more we can unpack with, with everything. I you're would, I would really like to come back. And that is gonna do it for us today, folks. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Mac as much as I did, and we will see you next time on the first mint.